I'm living here for eight months because uh, I'm working in COVID-19 center to save my family from the virus. I try to make distance from my family. This is uh, my reason to live here in living room. It's hard that you, you live in one house, but you feel as live another place. Hannah Sampson is a nurse at the St. Paul's Hospital in Ethiopia. Like many low-income countries, Ethiopia has struggled to secure vaccines, leaving its frontline workers in a vulnerable position. In December 2020, Hannah contracted the virus while working at a COVID-19 treatment center. They took me in the hospital. When I arrived in the Millennium COVID care center, I lost my consciousness <laughs> because I'm afraid and everybody is uh, coming and caring of myself and they took me in high dependency unit. I spent for the 16 days and they give me oxygen, they give me unexplainable support for me, they saved my life. For Hannah and many other healthcare workers in the world's poorest countries, getting a vaccine hasn't been an option. I was afraid uh, when I was uh, sick and uh, when I heard our colleagues dying. It's a difficult time for me, for my family, for my friends, colleagues. But a global initiative called COVAX is trying to ensure that people in all corners of the world get access to vaccines. Because of COVAX, Hannah was able to get vaccinated, and it might be the best bet for immunizing the rest of the world too. As rich countries race to inoculate their populations, poor countries have fallen behind in the biggest vaccination campaign in history. And that's a problem for everyone. Wildly uneven and unfair, that's how the UN describes the distribution of COVID vaccines around the world. Very few of those doses, a very small proportion of them, have been used in low and middle income countries. There's five or six of these variants that I would say are, are of concern out there. The thing that we worry about the most, that it will essentially evade the protection of the vaccine. The pandemic has weighed heavily on developing economies. Take the example of Ethiopia. It's long been seen as one of Africa's most promising economies, but the country has a sizable debt. At the end of 2019, its total public foreign debt stood at $27.8 billion, according to the World Bank. The pandemic has put pressure on the healthcare system and the economy, leading Ethiopia to ask for debt relief under a G20 program to help poor countries reeling under the economic impact of coronavirus. Many low-income countries, even before the pandemic, were facing financial constraints, huge debt loads, and really didn't have the financial capacity to negotiate bilateral deals with the vaccine developers like developed countries, Europe and the US, were able to. I've long argued that pandemics are an evolutionary certainty. Seth Berkeley is the head of Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance. He's an epidemiologist, and you know he's really devoted, you know, the past year to fighting uh, the pandemic. He conceived of this COVAX initiative at Davos in January 2020, realizing that when the pandemic really hit and we had vaccines, the real challenge would be providing equitable access to countries that couldn't afford to buy them on their own. My job is to try to solve these problems and put in place systems to do that. And so at this Davos meeting, we heard about this new epidemic that was going on. It was early days. We didn't know if there were people to people transmission, but I sat down with Richard Hatchett, who's the CEO of CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, and we discussed what we were doing. So that really was the beginning of the collaboration. Of course, a lot happened since then. At the end, they focused on the R&D, we focused on the procurement and delivery, and WHO focuses on the normative side of things. But um, we came together 
working like we do in the Alliance with multiple partners. For the first time, we've seen the whole world come together, at least in name, in terms of COVAX and wanting to move forward. More than 190 countries are participating in the COVAX facility. The wealthy countries are participating through paying for their doses through this purchasing pool that COVAX has set up, while COVAX provides the low-income countries with doses for free through money it has raised from governments, development agencies, as well as uh, private sector contributions. When we decided to do COVAX, we didn't have any deals, we didn't have any money. We had to go out and raise money, we had to begin to talk to manufacturers, and of course, to make a deal with a manufacturer, you have to have the finance in place. COVAX is a huge international effort, uh, the biggest international effort since the Paris Climate Accords. It has required a massive fundraising effort from governments around the world. It, it's a procurement challenge. They've had to negotiate deals with pharmaceutical companies to secure doses on timing and delivery. And then at the same time, they've had to prepare countries around the world for the rollout on the ground, and that has uh, been a huge, um, you know, logistical challenge. The arrival of this particular vaccine has uh, come as a great relief to health workers and a lot of Ghanaians. COVAX is aiming to deliver 2 billion doses by the end of the year. It has so far raised almost $7 billion. It just came out with a new initiative to raise an additional 2 billion but there's still a long way to go. They need more money and they need more doses. Is it enough what they have achieved? Of course it's not, but it's not a question of money for the time being. It's a question of what access to vaccines um, do they, are they going to be given by others um, um, so that they can take care of the majority of the world population. What is surprising is that wealthy countries haven't donated more to COVAX, given that it's really in their self-interest. Uh, if the virus continues to rage uh, in low-income countries, that will only mean that it's likely to boomerang back into uh, the developed world. New mutant strains will develop, and it'll be incredibly hard to stop COVID in its tracks. Right now, we have a situation where wealthy countries have ordered many times uh, the amount of doses they need. It's really time now to turn that around and either begin to uh, make those uh, doses available through dose sharing or to free up the places in the manufacturing queue. And that will uh, allow doses to go across the world, get us to a place where we can end the acute phase of the pandemic as quickly as possible. But it's not just the wealthiest countries complicating COVAX's efforts. It's been pretty challenging for COVAX to get its own supplies. Vaccine nationalism is still front and center. Vaccine nationalism is a huge uh, challenge for the COVAX initiative. It's heavily dependent on the AstraZeneca vaccine uh, because of its low cost and easy distribution. AstraZeneca is producing the vaccine on its own as well as uh, through an independent manufacturer in India called the Serum Institute. But India itself is facing a second wave of infections uh, and has curbed large-scale exports of the vaccine. The other challenge that COVAX faces is its dependency on the AstraZeneca vaccine, which has seen these reports of rare blood clots associated with the shot. And that has given rise to vaccine hesitancy around the world. You've seen reports of people not showing up and doses going to waste because of concerns about the safety of the vaccine. Even though those uh, reports are exceedingly rare, I think it does pose a challenge for rolling out doses worldwide. There are also major challenges to produce the vast quantity of vaccines needed around the world. Normally in the world, we use about three and a half billion doses of vaccine a year. If you add flu to that, it ends up being about five billion. People are talking about trying to cover the whole world. That would be another 10 to 15 billion doses that would have to be done in the course of this year. That would be a quadrupling of global supply. Um, that is very ambitious, not just for the manufacturing capacity, but also the raw materials, the supplies, the staff. And so this is a real challenge for the world. 
Pharmaceutical companies have been criticized for not releasing their formulas so that more manufacturers can produce at scale. Some say COVAX should be doing more to pressure them. Anna Marriott, the health policy advisor for Oxfam, argues that these manufacturing issues could have been mitigated by COVAX. You know, I think right from the outset, um, COVAX should have used its enormous leverage. It could have pushed those pharmaceutical corporations to share the vaccine science and know-how. We know that there are many offers on the table from manufacturers from Bangladesh, Pakistan, to Denmark and Canada, who are coming forward now and saying we could help make these vaccines if the vaccine science was, was shared and the intellectual property uh, rules removed. If we'd done that much earlier on, those manufacturers could be helping us now making those vaccines. It's certainly not too late. We do have to act now. But COVAX argues the issue lies in teaching other manufacturers the detailed analytics, tests and quality assurance procedures needed to make the vaccines. The issue is not for vaccines that patents are the blocker. There may be a patent or two, but those could be gotten around if one needed to. The real challenge is can you get those thousands of pages of know-how and can you have those transferred? Beyond the immediate manufacturing problems hampering COVAX's rollout lies an even bigger problem. The initiative's donations will provide doses that will cover only about 30% of populations in low-income countries. That's nowhere near what's needed to achieve herd immunity. Countries like Ethiopia, for instance, is entirely dependent on the COVAX initiative. It has something like 110 million people. Um, and so far, it's only administered about 400,000 doses. So they have a long way to go before they get anywhere near what, you know, scientists believe is herd immunity uh, to stop the pandemic and its tracks. COVAX may not be a silver bullet to the world's vaccine equity problem, but ending the pandemic will be almost impossible without it. Well, COVAX is the solution to it. There is no other one. Uh, which, uh, tell me which other organization has uh, uh, tried to bite the bullet here? Which other organization has been so ambitious that they are uh, promising to do everything what it takes to give a vaccine also to those who cannot afford it? There is no other one, so they have to be supported. Of course, at the end of the day, the real question now is, will the doses be available? Will the companies make the doses? Will, as high-income countries reach a certain threshold, begin to say, we'll release some of the excess doses that we have and make those available? And will be, we be able to scale up manufacturing? If we can do that, then we'll be in a world where the world has been protected during a pandemic. If we can't do that, we will be in a, a world that is very unfair and very inequitable, and that's exactly what we're trying to stop through COVAX.